Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited that you're here for our Marvelous Maples uh, live stream here. I'm at Bruce's Mill um, up in uh, Richard Stouffville on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, uh, the Mississaugas of Williams Treaty. And we are so, I am so excited to be here to be talking about how amazing maples are. We are going to be learning all about maples, what's happening here in our sugar bush at Bruce's Mill. Um, but before we get into all of that, I wanted to introduce who's here. So my name is Janelle. Um, I am a teacher with the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. I am joined in the back end by Jasmine. Hello everyone. Jasmine, she'll be coming on uh, again at the end to help us with questions and answers at the end. Um, Raya is in the chat. So if you're in the chat, you can say hello to Raya as well. Um, and then we'll also be uh, joined by some guests um, that are staff here at Bruce's Mill, who's gonna teach us a little bit more about what's happening in the forest here. Um, the chat also uh, is something that you can use. So to um, all the uh, educators or anyone watching, please feel free to use the chat uh, for any questions or comments. I'm going to be asking uh, some questions throughout the live stream. So you can feel free to put your answers there as well. And we'll be sure to um, touch on them. And the last thing I wanted to say that there is a worksheet associated with this live stream. So if you are a teacher and you would like this worksheet and you have not already registered for the worksheet, uh, you can find the link uh, in the chat that you can click and register for that worksheet, or you can scan that QR code, which will bring you to uh, the registration page for the worksheet. So with all that being said, um, let's learn a little bit more about maples. So as I mentioned, I am out here in the forest. It is a um, overcast day, but beautiful day. I'm so excited to be here. Um, and you may be thinking this is kind of a weird time to be talking about trees and how marvelous they are. Because if I look around the forest right now, there's nothing too marvelous about what's happening out here. Um, but a lot of the trees look pretty dead. Um, they aren't doing much. It's just sort of gray and drab out in the forest. However, there's lots of things happening in the forest right now. Some that we can't necessarily see. A lot of our trees right now in the forest have lost their leaves. So a lot of the trees that we see without any leaves that look dead are actually just sleeping. They're what we call dormant. They are deciduous trees. Deciduous trees decide to lose their leaves in the fall. And that's because their leaves are what is making food for them, making energy for them. And when they don't have as much sun or uh, shorter days and it's too cold, it's very hard for them to make those leaves or to make sugar in their leaves for food food um, throughout the winter time. So they just drop them and they're like, I'd rather just go to sleep. They drop those leaves, but all of that sugar and water and minerals that is flowing throughout the trees in the spring and the summer and into the fall, the tree has to put that somewhere. So all of those things make their way down the tree, down their trunk, and it's stored in their roots throughout the winter time. And those roots will make or will make sure that that water, minerals and sugar doesn't freeze. It will store it down there for them. And as soon as our days get a little bit longer and a little bit warmer, the trees know that it's, start, it's time to start working again. And we'll pull up that water and minerals and sugars up into its trunk and push it out into its branches. And that is what's gonna start our leaves to start growing again on these trees so that we can see the forest how we usually think of forest now that mixture of the water and minerals and sugar that is all the way down into the in the roots that will flow throughout the tree that is what we call sap now all trees have sap and it may look different uh feel different uh even tastes different uh, depending on the tree that you are looking at. But all trees have sap. It all has the same life-giving properties for these trees. And at the end of winter time, spring, sap starts to flow again, or um, running through the trees. Um, and that's why we're out in the forest at this time of year. Because although there's not much happening on the trees, on a lot of our deciduous trees, there's a lot of stuff happening in the trees. and and happening in the trees is the beginning of this whole live stream and why we're talking about maples. So let's learn a little bit more about maple trees. And um, throughout this live stream, we're gonna learn how to identify them, 
Uh, we're going to be learning why they're important. And then we're going to be learning a lot more about that sap that they produce um, and what happens with that sap and what we can do with that sap um, and why we recognize maples as how marvelous they are today. So let's learn how to identify a maple tree. So maples, as we know them, um, they have different names in different languages. So in the indigenous language for the people that have been on these lands uh, for time immemorial, so in Kenyankaha, uh, which is a Mohawk language, maples are known as wata. So if you see a maple tree, you could say that is wata. Um, in Anishinaabe Moen, which is an Anishinaabe language, uh, they're known as in Ninatig, there we go, Ninatig. Um, and these trees know these names. So if you want, you can use these names to address the maple trees in the forest or in your neighborhoods that you know. Um, our maple trees, a lot of us, like when you hear maple, you probably have an idea of what they look like. Um, and that's because our maple trees are super well known in our forests and our communities and our neighborhoods. And that's because our maple leaf is on a very important flag, uh, which is our Canadian flag. So that uh, right, white and red Canadian flag has a maple leaf right in the middle. And you can see the comparison between a sugar maple leaf on the side there and the leaf in the middle of our flag. So maple trees are so important to Canadian culture that it's even on our flag. I'm gonna learn about why they're so important in just a little bit. But how I know that those leaves are the same other than they look very similar, it's because our maple leaves have lobed leaves. So this is a way that we can identify leaves. Some leaves are toothed, some are smooth. Our maple leaves are lobed. And it just means that in between each section of that leaf, and you can see on the picture here, there are U's. So those green U's in between each section of the leaf signify the start of a new lobe. And that lobe, uh, you can count how many lobes there are and that will help you identify uh, the tree uh, but those lobe leaves are very characteristic of our maple trees so I want to give you a little test hope you've been listening because I want you to try to identify which leaves on our next slide here are lobed leaves so uh, you can answer this in just in your classroom you can answer it just in your head if you want you if you're uh, joining from your computer you can put your answers in the chat but my question for you is which one of these leaves or which leaves there may be more than one are lobed so we have our beech leaves we have white oaks we have sugar maples we have horse chestnuts and we have elms so i'll give you a chance to think about which leaves are lobed here I hope there are some things coming into the chat. And if you're still thinking, I'll give you about 10 more seconds. And then I'm gonna give you the answer. All of these leaves are leaves that we can find in our forest all around us, even in this forest here. Um, so it's important, some of them may look similar. Some of them may look very different than maple leaves. But if you guessed that B, the white oak, and C, the sugar maple are lobed leaves, you are correct. So maple leaves aren't the only lobed leaf out there. Um, but when you get to know your maples a little better, you can start to see the difference between what an oak would look like and what a maple would look like. Uh, they sort of, maple leaves are sort of, um, sort of thick, like how your hand is sort of uh, short up and down and then they have these, these would be my lobes. They sort of look like a hand, whereas our oak leaves are more long usually and their lobes are very close to the middle of the leaf there. All right, I have one more test for you about how we can identify leaves. Which one or which leaves here are lobed? So we have our red maple, our Norway maple, a silver maple, or a sugar maple. And hopefully this test is a little easier than the first one. I know you're thinking about it and I know you probably have all the answers because I've mentioned that our maple leaves have characteristically lobed leaves and guess what? All of these leaves are maple leaves and so they're all lobed. But even within the different types of maple trees, um, you can see that their lobes may look 
deep use um, to make the lobes very pronounced, or they may be very shallow use like our Norway maple, um, and those lobes aren't as pronounced. All right, so we know what maple leaves look like. So let's take a look around the forest and see if we can identify any of these trees around us based on their leaves. Oh, wait a second. We already talked about how all of our trees don't have leaves on them right now. So that may be a, bit, a little tricky. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's take a look though. There are a couple of trees that do have leaves. There is this tree here um, that has kept on some of its leaves throughout the winter time. Uh, let's take a closer look. Let's get this close here. Is this a lobed leaf? Hmm. It doesn't have those used, but I have these like little things along the side here. This is actually not a lobed leaf. So this is a tooth leaf of a beech tree. All right. So I um however I didn't know I would for sure at least know that it's not a maple tree because it doesn't have those lobes however none of my other trees around here have leaves on them so it's going to be hard to try to identify a maple tree based off of the leaves in this season but there's other ways that we can do it so we can take a look at the branching of a tree in order to help us figure out what kind of tree we're looking at and help us find the maples in this forest there are two main types of branching that trees can have. They can have either opposite branching or alternate branching. So when I say opposite branching, I mean when I go on a main stem of a tree, and I'm just going to try to find you an example here. Um, there's also a picture that will be coming up shortly to show you. But when you go to a main stem of a tree, like this one here, when you go as you travel up that main stem, you can see that there is a point at which there are twigs that come off this main stem and they are right, right across from each other on this branch. So we call this opposite branching. As I go up further, I may see it again. You can see that there are two branches coming off at the same, we call it node on this branch. Now, you may have seen that as I go up this branch, there's one that goes off of one side Ooh, this is a little hard to see. One that goes off one side here and the other side here. This looks like alternate branching. So that's our other, our other type of branching. Um, however, I know that this tree has opposite branching, but that example, there might have been a twig that fell off at that node. And so it looks like alternate branching instead of opposite branching. There are only a few trees that have opposite branching. Um, and those trees include our maples, our ashes, our dogwoods, and our horse chestnuts. So those are the main trees around here that have opposite branching. And one way I can know is by the acronym MAD HORSE. So MAD, M for maples, A for ash, D for doghood. And then we just say horse for horse chestnut because otherwise M-A-D-H doesn't necessarily spell anything. So MAD HORSE are our opposite branching trees almost everything else has alternate branching. So if this, if this beech tree did not have leaves on it, and I was thinking maybe this could be a maple tree, I would see that if I look up close, as I go up this main stem, one twig comes off of one side, I go up a little further, and one twig comes off of the other side. This is alternate branching. But I did see a tree over here with opposite branching. So there's a good chance that this tree, this little itty bitty tree here is a maple. However, I mentioned that there's other trees that have opposite branching. So it could be an ash tree, it could be a dogwood tree, or it could be a horse chestnut. And it's kind of hard to tell at this age um, what the tree is because the next thing I wanna look at is the bark on the tree. So the bark on the tree is what is covering uh, the outside of the tree, which protects our trees. Um, and when their trees are young, their bark of all the species often look pretty similar. Uh, so it's kind of hard to tell when they're this young, but as trees get older, just like how we get older, the trees get wrinkles oftentimes. And so you can see that this tree over here looks a lot different than that baby tree. You can see all these, we call them fissures um, or grooves in the bark here. So I can take a look at the bark to sort of try to figure out what kind of tree I have. Let's take a look at what we're not looking for first. So let's, we're gonna look at our opposite branching trees. 
uh, and the bark of those trees so we know what not to look for when we're looking for maples in the forest. So the first one we're going to look at is ash trees. So ash trees, like in the picture on the slide here, uh, their bark, if you look very carefully, it looks like they have little diamonds. Um, in their fissures. So they have diamond shaped grooves throughout their tree. Um, so we are looking for a tree uh, that does not have diamond shaped grooves. All right, because our ashes have diamonds and opposite branching. So we're not looking for diamonds. Okay, next. How about our horse chestnut trees? So our horse chestnuts have that sort of big, flaky, dark brown, dark gray um, bark. So we're also looking for trees that don't have big scaly flaky dark bark okay so no diamonds no big scales what's next our dogwoods so our dogwoods come in lots of shapes and sizes and colors for bark um a lot of our dogwoods are actually shrubs they're kind of short down to the ground um and pretty hard to um mistaken for a maple tree but there is a type of um dogwood that we could potentially mistake for a maple tree because they do get quite big and they're called flowering dogwood. Our flowering dogwoods have these blocky chunks all throughout their bark um, and those are the grooves or fissures. Uh, they're shaped in these blocky chunks. All right, so we're looking for things without diamonds. We're looking for things that don't have big scales. We are looking for things that don't have these blocky chunks in their bark. So what are we looking for then? Well, that's not as easy as ruling things out. So our maples are actually really variable depending on what species you're looking at. But the main thing to know about maples is they usually have pretty light bark, so light in color, um, maybe a light gray or a light brown, and they have a regular groove. So there's no sort of rhyme or rhythm, there's no shapes in them, um, and they're not flaky. So let's go back to this big tree over here. So when I'm looking at this tree, I don't see anything like diamonds. I mean, I could look over here. This sort of looks like a diamond, but it's much bigger than the ones that are on ash trees. And it's not regular. I don't see any other diamonds. Okay. Do I see scaly flaky bark? No, not really. It's pretty all smooth, pretty close to the, the surface of the tree. Do I see big blocky chunks? Not really. I don't see blocky chunks either. What I do see is irregular fissures or grooves in the bark. So there's no rhyme or rhythm to this. Um, it is a cool pattern, but it's not really any sort of regular pattern. Also, this tree has really light gray patches on it. So it's a really light shade of uh, gray brown on this tree. And by looking all the way up to the top of this tree, I can also see that this has opposite branching. So it has opposite branching, it's one of those bad horse trees, and it has light colored bark with irregular grooves. I know that this is a maple. So this maple tree here could be um, a star in this forest during this season, or is a star in this forest during this season. Um, and we're gonna learn a little bit more about why maples are so marvelous now that we can identify them. So thanks Maple for giving me your bark so that I can uh, show everyone how to identify you. Um, that maple there was a sugar maple. So once you get really good into identifying trees, you can take a look at the types of um, barks that define different types of our maple trees. Um, and you can learn more about the different types of maples, what makes them different other than their leaves. Their uh, buds are another thing that make them different as well, and their bark. So there's lots of different types of maples that we can explore and learn about um, in these forests. But I mentioned we're going to be talking about what makes maples so marvelous, and there's lots of things. So maples, like all other trees, they're really good at a lot of different things. They're good at cleaning our air. Uh, so when they have leaves on, they do photosynthesis, taking up carbon dioxide from our air um, and other pollutants to clean them up. Uh, but they also provide us with oxygen. So one large maple can provide enough oxygen for a full day's worth of oxygen for four people, which is kind of cool. Uh, they clean our water with their roots. They hold in our soil. Um, they provide shade. They provide food. Uh, they provide homes and habitats. They provide wood. So, I mean, outside of all of these things that these maple trees do, um, there are so many things that we use them for. There's so many things that um, they are important for in our forest, including um, 
contributing to biodiversity. Uh, but one thing that we know for sure about them, why they're so important at this time of the year, is because they have all that sap that we were talking about at the beginning of the uh, live stream that is flowing up their, their trunks at this time of the year. So this sap is really sweet which is why they are sought after and revered at this time of the year. In a lot of indigenous communities, our maple trees are known as leaders of the forest. They signify the start of spring, changing of seasons, start of new life and new relationships. Um, they are part of ceremony. And that sap that comes out of the tree is a really important part in thinking about syrup and sugar. And that's why a lot of people know our maple trees um, because of the sugar and sap that we can get from um, our sugar and syrup that we can get from their uh, sap. So let me take a let's take a really quick look at the sap in this tree. So I have found another maple tree here and this maple tree has a oops, sorry, a bucket attached to it. And this bucket is collecting sap from this tree. Now if I take a look inside, the sap, it looks a lot like water, doesn't it? Now this water uh, is not water, it's sap, but sometimes we call it sweet water or in Anishinaabe Moan, we call it Nintagwa, <laughs> I am so sorry, uh, Nintagwa, Waven. I will come back to it, uh, but the sweet water. And it's a really important in a lot of um, indigenous communities. It has a lot of health benefits. Some people will drink it just as the sap um, and at some point, people have found that they could make syrup out of it and sugar as well. And that sweet syrup and sugar um, was good for seasoning meats. It was good for eating. Um, and we don't necessarily, there's lots of stories about how people got from sap to syrup um, in a lot of different indigenous communities. Um, but I will, what I will say is how we get to syrup today and how, syrup, how we know syrup today is knowledge that has been um, acquired from indigenous communities and passed on to European uh, settlers that came to this land um, and learned how to process that sap and make it into syrup and sugars. Um, and today, Canada is what is the largest producer of syrup or maple syrup in all of the world. So I'm really excited, as I mentioned, to be here at Bruce's Mills because we have this really great opportunity to learn a little bit more about how maple syrup is made from maple sap. Um, we are joined by um, some staff here. I'm going to turn the camera around so you can see them just a little bit. Um, but we are going to learn first how early European settlers um, made syrup. Sorry, I'm just switching for my camera. And made syrup in times where there wasn't a lot of um, resources, but there was a lot of work uh, being done. So I'm joined here at the station uh, by Martin and Ben over here. And we are so happy that you're able to teach us a little bit more about this, Martin. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, as you probably know from every science class you've ever taken, sugar is life for all carbon-based life forms. That's us. And so we need to get we need to have sugar, have things available. And the trees gave early settlers the sap and they learned the techniques from indigenous people who've been here for tens of thousands of years. What the settlers did is they brought uh, iron and steel culture with them. So you could take a, a brace and bit. That's this tool here with a great big um, bit on the end that is, does a nice job drilling into a tree. You go in. I'm not going to drill into this tree because I don't want to hurt it. Uh, you go in about this far, about six or seven centimeters to make your hole and then uh, take out the brace and bit and put in this. It's called a spile. And this is a little, a little drainage tap. And if you take a look at it, the uh, sap comes out of here and drips into a bucket. But the hole for it is on the bottom because sap is going up the tree in the springtime. And so this collects a little bit from the tree, not enough to hurt it. You take this and then what the early settlers did is what Ben is gonna show you over here. They boiled it down. 
Thanks so much, Martin. Ben, what is happening over here? Okay. So what you heard about maple syrup being a lot of work is true. So European settlers, what they would have to do is they would have all of their buckets set up around their sugar bush, which is a forest full of sugar maple trees. And they would have had to carry those heavy buckets on a shoulder yoke and bring them back to this next piece of European technology that they brought with them over from Europe, which would be these large iron kettles. Okay. So I will pour some more sap that we've collected into our first kettle. And here we have kettles that are set at three different heights. So the first kettle is the lowest and this gets the hottest heat. And the whole goal of making any sort of maple syrup product, whether it's syrup, maple sugar, taffy, is you want to get less water and more sugar. So first we have to put it closest to the fire. Excuse me, I've got some <coughs> smoke. Uh, closest to the fire to get the most water out of the sap. So we're really trying to boil off a lot of water here. And then as we get less water and more sugar, we need to lift it further away from the fire because it's really easy to burn sugar. And we don't want to do that. Otherwise it won't taste good and it will ruin the product. So we put it into this next kettle a little bit further away. Again, the goal here is less water and more sugar. And they would keep moving it from kettle to kettle until you reach this third and final kettle where it would reach syrup and you might be able to store this for a little while but the thing about syrup is that it goes bad if you don't refrigerate it and a few hundred years ago there weren't any to put the syrup into so they would keep removing the water from the syrup until they got maple sugar and they could use this as a preservative to store other foods in when salt from the sea wasn't available um, they would cook with it and uh, it was a really valuable resource for them. And that's how they would have done it in that, uh, in the, for the European settlers method. That's really interesting. I noticed while I'm here that there's different colors in these, um, in these big kettles. What is happening there? So part of the color that could be from the kettle is that these are iron kettles. Now these kettles would have been very expensive and uh, they would have, one family could really only afford one kettle. So many farms would come together and share these kettles for them. So that's one reason why you might notice some of the color. Uh, the second reason for the color and probably the more interesting maple syrup fact is that as we are re removing more and more water through the process of evaporation, you see all this steam coming off, is that the sugar content is increasing. So you have again, less water and more sugar and maple syrup we know has that sort of brownish, can be golden brown to a very dark color, very dark brown um, uh, syrup. So that's why there might be some differences in the color as we move from kettle to kettle. That is fascinating. Thanks so much, Ben. Thank you, Martin, uh, for teaching us how the early settlers would have done maple syrup. Oh, what do you got here? I'm just going to pick up on something that Ben just showed you. Children, you are a valuable source of labor in the 18th and 19th century because you could get your parents to make for you a shoulder yoke. And then you would be carrying buckets to the boiling area or over to a hogshead on a sleigh being driven by your older brother or sister on being dri driven by a horse through the woods. So there you go. I've heard that, so March break is next week, and I've heard that one of the reasons why March break exists is to put children to work. Is that, a, is that true? Well, I'm not going to stand here in the 21st century and tell you that I'm in favor of child labor, but kids who are watching, you might have been a couple hundred years ago. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Yeah. So uh, that is true. In um, a couple hundred years ago, when children were helping in the sugar bus to collect uh, sap from all the trees, they would have a whole, this is such an important time of year that they would have time off of school, of their normal studies, in order to collect sap throughout their sugar bushes uh, from all of these pails that would have been lining all of the trees. Um, in their forest close by. Now I am walking to our next station here in the sugar bush at the Maple Syrup Festival at Bruce's Mill. And as I'm walking, I am noticing that there are different things coming out of the trees now. 
Um, we are going through time. We are um, coming out of that early European settler um, way of making maple syrup and collecting maple sap. Um, and we're moving into our modern age. And we can see all of these tubes coming from the trees, uh, which have replaced all of those metal buckets. Um, and this is how people collect sap these days. So all of these tubes throughout the forest connect and uh, they will eventually go to a place where sap is collected and made into the syrup that we know and love that we can find in our stores. So I am approaching our modern demonstration and here we have Joe and Marco who are going to tell us a little bit more about how we get maple syrup today and what that process is like. So hi Joe. Hello Janelle and welcome everyone to the uh, the modern method station for our maple syrup festival. Uh, so you would have already learned right possibly from Janelle or from the previous stations that uh, this time of year in the spring right something special happens in our forest. So this is a maple maple uh, tree uh, sugar bush and today we're able to recognize from certain cues, all right, that it is time to start tapping our trees and to harvest the sap, which is eventually going to be made into maple syrup. So uh, people today would use tools like temperature sensors or thermometers. Uh, maybe they're measuring pressure. Maybe they're also observing uh, the environment. So when the snow is melting. So the time to harvest uh, sap maple trees would be when the temperatures during the day are a little bit warmer, so above zero, and then the temperatures at night are colder, below zero, all right? So if you guys rec remember from your science classes, zero degrees Celsius is the temperature when water freezes. So that difference, warm in the day, the sap flowing is liquid, it's gonna be water, and during the night, some of that water freezes. So that's what creates a condition where sap can flow very freely because sap actually flows up a maple tree and the sap is plant food, it's tree food. And that sap is used in the spring to feed the, uh, the leaves and the, uh, and the new buds from the growing tree. Back in indigenous people days, right? They wouldn't have had um, temperature sensors or uh, pressure sensors or barometers they would have taken their cues from nature. They would have observed what birds are coming back into, uh, into the forest, you know, like crows. Uh, I think we saw some Canada geese today come, come back. They're taking their cues from, from nature and they're observing the, the natural world as part of uh, their traditional economic, uh, ecological nature uh, learning or knowledge. Um, so we're very fortunate today. We have a lot of modern tools to be able to help us uh, in in the quest to make maple syrup. Um, I'm going to point out this device here. All right, so what you're seeing here is called an evaporator. And in the early European station that you had uh, looked at earlier, uh, you saw the three kettles and you would have learned that sap was delivered into the uh, first kettle in order to uh, evaporate or remove some of the water, okay? and then subsequently transferred to the second kettle where more water was removed and then to the third kettle where a lot more of the water was, was removed, okay, by evaporation. So this modern uh, evaporator does the same sort of thing. So if you look inside the evaporator, you will see a liquid in there and that is the sap that we have collected from the trees and the sap's being collected in a bucket right so I think you guys peeked inside the bucket you saw the sap so what we do in a modern evaporator and something small like this would not be used in a uh, in a modern maple syrup factory it would be used more in a, a hobby farm or a craft uh, maple syrup facility and they would collect up the syrup and they would pour it into the first chamber here And from the first chamber, now we're very able to carefully control how much sap is delivered into the heating pan, 
All right, so these pans here are divided into three chambers. And the first chamber, a lot of the uh, liquid is, is flashed off, okay? So the modern evaporator allows us to be able to do something else as well. We can very, very con carefully control a lot of the parameters, such as the heat, the amount of liquid that's remaining. We measure things like temperature, we measure things like water uh, content, and we also measure sugar content. So we're able to very, very carefully control aspects of the maple syrup making process. From that, we're able to make maple syrup a lot quicker than the early European kettle method. Mm -hmm. And I think you heard from the uh, early European station, it took about two days, sometimes three days to go from sap to finished product and their finished product was maple sugar so for us on a using a modern evaporator it only takes about six hours for us to go from sap to maple syrup okay and the maple syrup when it's finished can come into a, a few different forms all right and i think you might have seen some of these maybe in the store Okay, so here's a chart that shows four different grades or colorations of maple syrup. All right, it uh, the, the we can have golden, amber, dark, and very dark maple syrup. So you can buy any of these in the stores today. And the difference in the coloration is due to when the sap was collected. All of these jars of maple syrup contain the exact same amount of sugar, which is about 66.5% sugar, and the rest is water. So they all contain the same amount of sugar. The differences in color is due to when the, uh, the sap was collected. Early in the collection season, right, right around now, early uh, beginning of March, uh, the sugar content of sap is a little bit higher. It's probably close to 4 or 5% sugar, and the rest is water. Which means that we don't have to boil off or evaporate as much water in order to get the finished product maple syrup. However, later on in the season, you know, towards the end of March, the sugar content of sap is lower. It's probably going to be around one, one and a half percent towards the end of the season, which means that we actually have to uh, evaporate more of the water in order to get the finished product of our target is 66 and a half percent sugar. That means that the, uh, the sap has to sit in our evaporator or finishing pans or evaporation pans for a lot longer. So the longer the sap sits in the evaporation pans, it also gets a little bit darker. So if you've ever, I don't know, uh, cooked a marshmallow on, a, uh, on an open fire, right? And you heat it up nicely, you know that the marshmallow will turn a nice brown color, all right, or a golden color. The, the same thing is happening to the sugar in our sap. As you heat it up, it will start to caramelize and it will start to take on that darker color. And does that affect the, uh, the sugar content? We've already learned that that's not the case, but it will affect the flavor of the maple syrup. So I would say if you want to try a few different colorations of maple syrup, you'll see what I mean. And some of them do taste a little bit different. And a lot of people think that the darkest or the very dark is the tastiest, right? Um, you probably all heard, already heard from my colleague Martin is that the very dark maple syrup is the best to cook with, right? If you want to use it on your pancakes in the morning, try the amber or the golden color. Those are the, probably the best for you. I've heard, um, so I've seen maple sugars before as well. How do you get from syrup to sugar? Is it the same sap? How does that process work? Well, it's all a question of how much water is left. So maple syrup, we've already learned, contains 66.5% sugar, 
which means that the, the rest of it is water. So 33 and a half percent or 32 and a half percent is remaining is uh, is water. As you remove even more and more of the water, now the consistency or the thickness of that syrup will also change. So as you remove more water, then the maple syrup becomes maple butter. Mm -hmm. And as you remove even more water, then that maple butter becomes maple taffy. And once you've removed almost 100% of the water and all you have left is the sugar, that is known as maple sugar. All right. So as we remove more and more water, the, 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 the sugar that's left behind is still the same. It's still going to be maple, but it's the presentation of it. So it goes from syrup to butter to taffy, then to uh, maple sugar. That is fascinating. I have one last question for you because I noticed looking around this forest, there are lots of buckets set up. There is lots of tubing set up. Um, and I'm wondering how much sap does it take to make maple syrup? That's a great question, Janelle. So in this forest, we have a number of different types of trees. We have a, different, a number of different types of maple trees. So the the, the maple tree type that is best for ma making maple syrup is sugar maples. All right. And the, the, the easiest way to see maple uh, sugar maples is that those are the ones that change colors the best in the fall. They get the nice red colors and the orange colors. And they also have the highest concentration of sugar. So at the beginning of the season, it's probably close to 5% sugar. Some of the other species of maple trees, like silver maple, uh, red maple, black maple, they have they also have sugar in their sap, but it's a lower concentration. So the uh, people making maple syrup will try to tap sugar maples first and foremost. And a sugar maple, to make one liter of maple syrup, you need to have 40 liters of sap to start with. So 40 buckets of sap produces one bucket of maple syrup. Um, other species of trees will need a little bit more sap. That is fascinating. Thank you so much uh, for telling us more about this modern station, for showing us this evaporator and teaching us more about how we get all different types of maple yumminess. Um, I really appreciate it, Joe. It uh, pleasure. Thank you for that. All right. Well, we are just about wrapping up here at Bruce's Mill. We are, we've learned a lot about maples. We've learned how to identify them. We've learned where to find them. We've learned how they store sap throughout the season. Uh, we have learned how people get the sap from them. We have learned different names for them as well. Um, but we, I want to end off just by reminding everyone that our maples are such an important part of our forest and even if they if we didn't harvest their sap for all the yummy syrup and taffies and sugars um, that we can get from their sap that sap that is in their trees is their life force it gives them life when we're tapping the trees for sap we're not taking too much we're being respectful of um how much they have to offer we are thanking them for their uh their contributions um and we're making sure that we're only tapping trees that are big enough to be tapped so we do have a rule of thumb um in order to tap our trees we don't tap little baby trees um uh, because they they need that sap in order to live and to grow and to grow up into bigger trees as well um because they're such an important part of our forest so I'm going to end it there. I do want to, uh, we are going to get into a question and answer period in just a bit. Um, but I wanted to first off say a great big thank you to Bruce's Mill for having me here today um, and for all of the staff that have helped us learn more about maples. Um, they do have their maple syrup festival on for the rest of the month. If you're interested in learning more about maples, you can come on down here or to any other of our um, TRCA conservation um, parks that are running the Maple Syrup Festival. There's a link in the uh, chat that you'll see here. And there's, if you can't get out to a TRCA,
Landscape Park. There are so many other opportunities to learn more about maples this season. Uh, so I encourage you to do that. Um, our next live stream is coming up on Earth Day. Uh, uh, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Earth Day and what you can do to help the planet, please join us uh, for that live stream that will be coming up uh, soon. And if you do have to leave, thank you so much for joining us on uh, this journey to learn more about maples and how marvelous they are. We've uh, had a blast having you here. Um, but if you're able to stay for questions and answers, uh, Jasmine, I'm wondering if there's been any questions or comments in the chat. Thanks so much, Janelle, for that amazing tour through Bruce's Mill. And I'm so grateful to the educators who talked to, to us about maple syrup production. It was so interesting to learn about. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat at the moment, so I'd encourage everyone watching, if you do have any questions about anything Janelle or the other educators have talked about today, please put your questions in the chat. But I was wondering, I have a question for you. I'm wondering, I know earlier you talked about the sugar maple, and I'm wondering if that is a native species. Maybe you can explain a little bit about what a native species is. And are there any maple trees here in Toronto or Ontario that are not native? this area? That is an excellent question. Yeah, so sugar maples are a native tree. And when I say a native tree or a native species, I mean that these trees or these species have been in this area for a very long time. They know the seasons, they know the weather, they know um, the other um, animal and plant community, communities that are around here. They've always been in these areas. Um, so there are they work really well with everything that's around us. Our our sugar maples, our silver maples, our black maples, our red maples, um, our even our striped maples, you may have remember a picture um, when I brought up the types of bark. Those are all native species of maple. There are some non-native species of maple and actually a lot of the maples in our neighborhood are non-native species of maple. They are what we call Norway maples. They're very similar to our sugar maples. Um, one way you can tell them apart is in the summertime or when they have leaves, if you break off a leaf at the base, it's a little bit milky at the base of their uh, leaf. That's a Norway maple. Um, and uh, Norway maples are non-native. Um, but there are, there are so many of them because they're a little bit more hardy than our sugar maples. Our sugar maples in particular are actually at threat um, from climate change because they do require a certain um, climate that they're used to being native plants. Um, and when things are changing, it gets a little bit harder for our maple trees. Um, so yeah, our sugar maples are native species. There are non-native species. There's also a Manitoba maple, which is non-native to Ontario, but it's actually native to other places in uh, Canada. So that's a very interesting one as well. Awesome. Thanks so much for answering that question. Um, I'm wondering if you know, it sounds like there are so many different types of maple trees that live here in Ontario. I'm wondering if you know what kinds of maple trees are used for maple syrup production at Bruce's Mill? That is an excellent question. Um, I do know that there are uh, sugar maples that they use here. I'm going to ask the experts, though. Uh, to see what they know about the different types of maples here at Bruce's Mill that are um, that sap is collected from. So, uh, Marco and Joe and Martin, do you have an idea of which trees are here at Bruce's Mills that are tapped? What type? Of What's tree? what type of maple trees? Oh, these are exclusively sugar maples. Ah. We only tap sugar maples here because they produce the highest sugar content. Okay. Now, highest sugar content is a sort of relative number. Don't forget, it's on a good day, it's 5%. Okay. So we're not talking about a huge amount of sugar. It's just more than other trees. Because as Joe was saying when he was teaching you about the modern method, it's about 40 to 1 for maple syrup, making maple syrup. 40 buckets of, of sap gives you one bucket of syrup. Uh, other trees, if you tap them, uh, for birch syrup, by the way, which is truly delicious, the ratio is 60 to 1. Hmm. So sugar yes. maples are our friends. Good to know. Thank you so much. And hi, Ben, again. <laughs> so, yeah, it's sugar maples here at Bruce's Mill. But as Martin mentioned, there are other trees that can be tapped, like birches. I've seen people tap walnuts as well um, and get some pretty delicious uh, sap from that. But, yeah, mostly our sugar maples here at Bruce's Mill. 
Awesome. That is so interesting. I think that's all the questions that we have for today. So I want to say thank you so much, Janelle, for your presentation. If you want to say uh, a final goodbye, now's the time. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining in. And thanks, Mrs. Mill staff. Um, it was a really great presentation. I'm really happy that I was able to be here at Mrs. Mills and teach you all about maple. So enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you don't have to do too much maple, or maple sap collecting over March break that is coming up very shortly. Um, but have fun regardless. And hopefully you can get out to a sugar bush and see what's happening out here. Bye, everyone. <laughs>